<clears throat> often you um, see a program or you get an email and they put in a disclaimer. You know what I mean? Yeah, disclaimer. No animals were hurt in the preparation of this uh, nature video. Something like that, you know. Well, <clears throat> I give you a disclaimer right from the start. It's a statement written by James White, which I'd like to share with you because it's um, helpful to keep this in mind as we look at prophecies which have not yet been fulfilled. You've got to be careful. <clears throat> All right. We're going to concentrate this afternoon on the last few verses of Daniel 11. Um, it deals with the king of the north in the last days and what he is going to do. And the statement here says, in general, Seventh-day Adventists have held the fulfillment of verses 45 to is yet uh, future. Well, we can start with verse uh, 40 to 45, probably. Uh, things that are not yet fulfilled. Then James White, years ago when he was alive, in 1877, wrote these words. The exposition of unfulfilled prophecy where the history is not written. The student should put forth his propositions with not too much positiveness, lest he himself, if I, he find himself straying in the field of fancy. In other words, he's saying we should not be dogmatic. Another word we could use, dogmatic. Don't be dogmatic about unfulfilled prophecy because if you think it's going to be fulfilled this way, you might be proved wrong if you wait long enough. Positions taken upon the Eastern question are based upon prophecies which have not yet met their fulfilment. Here we should tread lightly and take positions carefully, lest we be found uh, removing the landmarks fully established in the Advent movement. It may be said that there is a general agreement upon this subject and that all eyes are turned toward the war now in progress between Turkey and Russia in the, as the fulfillment of that portion of the prophecy which will give a great confirmation of faith in the soon loud cry and close of our message. But what will be the result of this positiveness if in unfulfilled prophecies should things not come to pass or not come out as very confidently expected is an anxious question. That was James White in the Review and Herald, November 29, 1877. So that's good counsel. As it turned out, the things that Uriah Smith was predicting were going to happen back in those days, as I'll point out in a little while, it didn't come about. And... Uh, Uriah Smith made the mistake that uh, the late W. Herbert Armstrong has made, you know, trying to fulfill or look at the fulfillment of prophecy and find the fulfillment in the newspaper headlines. I have told my students over the years, <clears throat> prophecy was not given by God to us to make us wise concerning political events. It's not the purpose of Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy was given to make us understand what is coming to the future and what is going to happen to God's church and the great plan of salvation that uh, God has put in place to save human beings from this world of sin. That's why we have prophecy telling us what's coming that's going to affect the church. And if we get away from the looking at the church in its seeking for fulfillments of Bible prophecy, we get into speculation, and it's dangerous. Um, we must keep that in mind. We all speculate, and uh, I don't think there's any sin in speculation, but we are not to dogmatize, we are not to be overconfident that what we think is going to happen it will happen, because often it comes the wrong way. Herbert W. Armstrong had to change his prophetic interpretation time and time again because the newspaper headlines kept changing. Take a position this year and ten years' time he's teaching something else because uh, he would follow the paper. And Uriah Smith did that. He looked at the current situation and 
He was pretty sure what was going to happen. We're going to look at what he had to say in a little while. And that didn't work out the way he has. And virtually nobody follows Uriah Smith today when it comes to Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Don't, uh, what he said about uh, some of those powers is today considered by practically all Adventist scholars as irrelevant because it didn't work out, it didn't happen. But the prophecy is there. <clears throat> And because it's part of God's word, the prophecy will be fulfilled, but it may not be fulfilled in quite the way that we expect. Well, let's have a look at Daniel eleven forty 40 to 45. You've got your Bibles, open them up and follow while I read. Daniel eleven forty 40 to 45. <clears throat> and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariot and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the, sepul- uh, into the countries and shall uh, overflow and pass over. Whatever you, is going to happen, one thing to me is clear. This is a picture of a great war. Great struggle of some kind. Because king of the north is going to return with horses and chariots and many ships in a campaign of some kind. And he's going to overflow into various countries. He shall enter into the glorious land, which is taken to be Palestine, the Holy Land, and many countries shall be overthrown. So that sounds like warfare to me, countries being overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon. Now, we don't have countries today called Edom or Moab or Ammon, but the countries that were called by those names uh, virtually today are in modern-day Jordan in the Middle East. And that is uh, maybe what they're talking about. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. So Egypt is specifically mentioned, would not escape. And he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt. The Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east shall trouble, uh, and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. All right. Those are the verses we want to get into in our study this afternoon. Who is the king of the north? And uh, who are the, what, what, what is going to happen with him? Who is the king of the south that's going to push at him and uh, be defeated, apparently, in some great uh, battle? Uh, there have been various interpretations throughout the history of the Seventh-day Adventist church, <clears throat> I'm concentrating on that now. There have probably been other interpretations by other denominations and other men. But in the SDA church, there have been four main interpretations as to who the King of the North is. <clears throat> First and all, <clears throat> the papacy. The thought that the papacy is the King of the North in these verses is built on the fact that the prophecies of Daniel... <clears throat> Daniel 2, Daniel 7, Daniel 8 and 9, and 11 and 12, these four great parallel prophecies of the book of Daniel, virtually are repeating the same theme, but each successive prophecy expands the theme and adds more detail than were in the previous ones. You follow what I'm saying? Daniel 2, the image, head of gold down to the toes of part iron, part clay. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Ten toes, you might say, represent the ten nations into which Rome divided. Daniel 7, the lion, the bear, leopard, the nondescript. The ten horns, the little horn, the wax exceeding great. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, pagan Rome, papal Rome, and ends up with God's kingdom. Same as Daniel 2 does with the stone cut out of the mountain without hands. Ends up with God's kingdom. Parallel prophecies, starting with Babylon, going through to the end, to God's kingdom at the end, being established. Daniel 8, 
We have the ram and the he-goat. Babylon is now in the past, so it starts off with Medo-Persia, the ram. The ram is attacked by the goat, Greece. And then comes a little horn. The text says out of one it would wax great towards the four winds. Out of one, one of them would come a little horn, which would wax exceeding great. Now, the grammar in the Hebrew language there does not allow of the little horn that waxed exceeding great to come out of one of the other horns. It came out of one of the other winds. Because the gender, you see, in other, uh, other languages than English, in English we have male, female, genders, and neutral. Or, and if a, if a man or animal or creature is male, it's put in the masculine. Females put in the female gender. The rest is neutral. But in other languages, you can have nouns that are talking about men, but it's a, fem- it's a female gender noun. I was a missionary in India. Policeman in India. Policeman is male. Man is a male. But the word police in the Hindi language is a feminine gender noun. And if you put an adjective in front of it, you have to use the, f- the female ge- uh, gender form of the adjective. Achi police. Whereas a male would be acha police. A chi police using a female gender for the adjective, meaning good police. A chi, a cha, a cha, a chi means good. So, in this uh, uh, interpretation, you have the word uh, uh, the gender can only refer to winds, not to horns. Out of one of the four winds came. Power. And of course that is true, out of the west you see, the four winds mean the four directions of the compass, Rome came from the west. All right, <clears throat> second was Turkey. Oh, Uri Smith said, king of the north has got to be Turkey. God's people are here, what's no, no, north of the Palestine is Turkey, modern day Turkey. So Turkey is the power. That's the, others have said, well, it, further north is Russia. So maybe Russia is the king of the north. And uh, then we have uh, uh, some who said it's the Ottoman Turkish Empire that uh, collapsed uh, many years ago in 1840. August 11, 1840 came to its end. All right. What has been the history in the Adventist church? Three main periods of history. The first one is from 1846, when you had people starting to look at these prophecies soon after the disappointment of 1844, and two years after, down to 1871, it was generally believed and taught that the papacy that was the king of the north. And here's an interesting fact. We know that James, James White believed and taught that, and, and I think he held to that view all his life. But what a lot of people don't know is that Uriah Smith himself believed that the papacy was the king of the north in his early days. But he changed his mind. He wrote up in his book that it was Turkey, and uh, that is what we, we have still with us. He's still got his book, that is. And, uh, and so a lot of people think that was always his view, but it was not. <clears throat> Why did he change his mind? Well... <clears throat> He changed his mind and started to teach Turkey and from 1871 to 1952. Most Adventists believed it was Turkey. In my boyhood days, and I was born in 1930, so now you know how old I am. 1930, I'll be 81 before Christmas. The um, interpretation when I was a boy was Turkey. And because Daniel 12 verse 1 says... At that time shall Michael stand up, People, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. And then Michael stands up, and Adventists used to say, watch Turkey. <clears throat> when Turkey collapses, probation will close. Now, do you think God has given us an indication when probation is going to close? No, I don't think so. But that's what Adventists used to say when I was a boy. And... Uh, 
That was standard fare among many Adventists, but today I don't hear that anymore. <clears throat> James White always believed it was um, the papacy. Why did Uriah Smith change his mind? Well, around the beginning of this period, 1871 and uh, soon after that, he changed his views the, um, and began to teach that Daniel 11, 36 to 39, referred to revolutionary France and that Daniel 11, 40 to 45, spoke of Turkey. <clears throat> now, every other major prophecy of Daniel, the first three major prophecies of Daniel, Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. Daniel 7 expands it to papal Rome following pagan Rome. Daniel 8 and 9, we have the work of the little horn, papacy, and then you have God's kingdom. Why would you suddenly introduce revolutionary France and, uh, and Turkey in there? The, it, it breaks the parallelism of the prophecies to do that. But that's what he did. And he did it because of political situations that ex existed back at that time. You see, <clears throat> war broke out between Turkey and Russia in 1877. And Smith that year preached on the Eastern question at a camp meeting that the Whites attended. You read about it in <clears throat> The Signs of the Times, November 15, 1877. An editorial written by James White appeared, reprinted in the Review and Herald in November 27, 1877, advising caution. I read you a little bit about his caution just a while ago. <clears throat> at that time, I told you what, uh, this morning what happened. James y uh, Uriah Smith rather, got up and preached on the Eastern Question at a camp meeting, and when he finished, James White jumped up and contradicted everything he said. <coughs> Ellen White gave that testimony to uh, her husband, saying you d should not have done that, rebuked him for it. <coughs> because Uriah Smith had held that it was the papacy, but he changed his mind, as I've said. And he said, quote, we have reached the preliminary movements of the great battle of Armageddon. That he wrote in the Review and Herald, June 6, 1878. And he's quite dogmatic about it. And Armageddon's about to start. Russia and Turkey having a go. Well, what, what's happened since then? 130 years, 140 years have gone by and there have been lots and lots of wars and so on since, since then. <coughs> well, he changed his mind. And how is it that his views lasted for so long. Well, in 1870, the Pope lost all of its temporal power. In 1798, the deadly wound was inflicted with General Berthier took the Pope prisoner. He died in Avalon in, in France as an exile. But in 1870, <coughs> the papacy lost what are known as the Papal States. A large area of central Italy was under the direct rulership of the Pope, known as the Papal States. And when Garibaldi came along and united the uh, Italy is the one nation, <coughs> they swallowed up the Papal States and made them part of Italy. And uh, all that the papacy had left was virtually uh, Vatican City and it was part of Italy. It wasn't until 1929 when Mussolini signed a concordat with the Pope Pius XII, I think it was, or was it one of the earlier ones, and gave the Vatican City to the Pope as a temporal kingdom. So now they have their own police force, they have their own law courts, they have their own bank, they have their own postage stamps. I've got some Vatican postage stamps and an old stamp collection I had since my boyhood days. And uh, it's, a, it's not part of Italy. You cross the, 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 for one, you wouldn't think you're crossing into another country when you're in Rome. If you've ever been there, walk from Rome into the Vatican, you just walk like crossing the street. Uh, you don't go through immigration, you don't go through customs, but it's a separate state. And that's why nations around the world send ambassadors there, because they say it's a state. Well, the only church in the world that has ambassadors sent to it. No nations of the world send ambassadors to England to be ambassadors to the Anglican church. Lambert Palace, <coughs> London. <coughs> and certainly no countries of the world send ambassadors to be <coughs> ambassadors to the General Conference of the SDAs, but they do to the Vatican even Australia. And the Vatican ambassador that comes to other countries is not called an ambassador. He's called the papal nuncio. Ever heard that word? Yeah. Well, a new word for the vocabulary maybe for some of you. That's the technical term for a 
Vatican ambassador to another country, the papal nuncio. That's what they call them. <coughs> All right. Now, <coughs> secular opinion that the papacy would recover from the loss of its papal states and the deadly wound of 1798 was not very high. Most people thought the papacy was finished. It would never again achieve the dominance that it had had during the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages. But what does the Bible say would happen? The deadly wound would be healed. So <clears throat> we know the healing process is going on. Introducing France and Turkey and Egypt made the prophecies seem to be more current and therefore more interesting because he brought in politics. People were watching the newspapers, so to start preaching something that paralleled the newspaper headlines seemed to get more people to come along to the meetings and so on when they're doing evangelistic uh, efforts. Russia so seemed ready to close in on Constantinople and the fall of Turkey seemed imminent because there was a war between the two countries, as we mentioned a while ago. This would or could cause Turkey to move its capital down to Jerusalem. So, again. And Bishop Newton and Adam Clark and others had linked Daniel 11, 40 to 45 to the Ottoman Empire. That's the way they interpret it in their commentaries. <coughs> All right. <coughs> now, we know that uh, some Bible interpreters have brought in the revolutionary France into Revelation, chapter 9, the French Revolution. Uh, sorry, Ottoman Turkish uh, Empire in Revelation 9, the day, the hour, the day, the month, and the year prophecy. And some have brought in the French Revolution in, Re in Revelation chapter 11. <coughs> So that seemed to uh, justify what he was doing there. Now, why did his views become dominant? Well, James White withdrew from the controversy that he was having with Uriah Smith. His wife had rebuked him, so he didn't uh, push his <coughs> position anymore. <coughs> you can read about that in Council to Writers and Editors, page 76-77, <coughs> where Ellen White wrote, my husband had some views which differed from those of some of his brethren. But I advised him that he should not split the church. I'm just paraphrasing what she was said there. White did not spell out his views as clearly as did Uriah Smith. Uriah Smith was a good writer, there's no doubt about that. And his book <coughs> has survived <coughs> more than a series of articles by James White printed in church papers. A book lasts on your bookshelf longer than a magazine. You're more likely to use a magazine to light your kitchen fire or your fireplace uh, than you are to use pages out of a book. And so <coughs> Uriah Smith's book was published, and it big substantial book like this, and people put it on the shelf and leave it there, and so it survived. But James White's articles in the magazines did not. And White died in 1881, and Uriah Smith was the editor for a total of eight years after James White died. So he had a free reign now to push his ideas in the Review and Herald because James White was no longer around to say anything contrary. He was dead. <coughs> if you want to read more, you can read the Ministry magazine. I have uh, it here. There was a special committee set up by General Conference years ago to report on the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel. This is Ministry Magazine, report of that research, and it's uh, dated uh, uh, March 1954. And so that's the source of my material that I've just uh, been giving uh, to you. Now, from 1952 to the present, the church has swung back to the position that uh, the king of the north is the papacy. And reasons for the return? Well, we can say... The events that Uriah Smith had so confidently predicted did not come about. So people turned away from his uh, views because what he said was going to happen, Armageddon didn't uh, develop, which he thought was going to happen almost any time, and so on. And uh, the article in Ministry magazine of November 1967 summarises by saying, the papacy is today generally held to be the king of the north. So most Adventist Bible scholars and teachers and preachers and so on today have swung back to the original position that we had before Uriah Smith introduced uh, Turkey, that it's the papacy. 
And that parallels all these other prophecies that end up with the papacy and the conflict between the papacy and God's people in the last days and then the kingdom of God established at the end as you have the parallel prophecies if you want to <coughs> spell them all out. Now, uh, arguments in favour of the papacy from Daniel 11, 36 to 39. Let's go back a few verses that we haven't looked at, haven't read yet. Uh, before we get into the verses that I read a while ago, 40 to 45, let's look at the verses that um, Uriah Smith applied to revolutionary France. Well, perhaps before we should do that, we should uh, point out that uh, in the early part of Daniel 11, it starts off with Persia. And uh, the... Uh, you can go through the SDA Bible commentary verse by verse, verse by verse, and I haven't got time to look at that today, nor would it be very helpful to what I want to say, whereas they interpret all the history that's there, and it's uh, very detailed, and a lot of scholarship gone into the interpretation, and Uriah Smith did a great job on, on that. But, <clears throat> you see, when the, <clears throat> when the Greek Empire broke up, Alexander died in his early 30s, 30, 31, I think he was, about 31. And uh, he had an 18-month-old baby boy as, an, as his heir. Well, he couldn't rule, and somebody murdered him anyway, so uh, no successor. It's reported that when he, Alexander was dying, he thought that maybe he died from malaria, that uh, somebody asked him, who's going to have your empire? Who's going to succeed you? And he's reported that he said, the strongest of you can have it. Well, his generals <coughs> waged war against it. Cassander took over Greece. Lysimachus took over a large part of the territory here. Seleucus took over here. And Ptolemy took over in Egypt. And Daniel 11 spells out the conflict between the king of the north and the king of the south. The king of the north being the Seleucid Empire. And the king of the south being Ptolemy's down in Egypt. And it's between these two rival powers, where were God's people? In the middle. Sandwich, meat in the sandwich, so to speak. And so the political events that transpired at that time become legitimate subjects for Bible prophecy because God's people are involved. They're caught between these two warring factions, see? <clears throat> and this went on <clears throat> for many years until Rome came. And, uh, and Tiger's Epiphanies that some people say was the Antichrist, the view being what we call praetorism, taking the prophecies that deal with the little horn and applying it to, to Antiochus Epiphanes rather than to the papacy, which, by the way, was a move by the papacy to take the heat off themselves. You know that, don't you? The Council of Trent, that went for 18 years, um, was called primarily to fight the Reformation. And um, the reformers, by the score were pointing to Rome and saying, you are the little horn. You are the man of sin, as 2 Thessalonians 2. You are the leopard-like beast, of Revelation 13. And so on and so on. And it was, it was hurting the papacy. <clears throat> they were losing members, thousands of people leaving the papacy, leaving Rome, the papal church, and joining the new coming, upcoming Protestant churches around Europe. And the the Catholics said, we've got to fight the Reformation. How, how, let's have a council decide how to do it. We've got to take a, find a way to interpret these prophecies so that don't apply to us. And Alcazar came up with praetorism. It's all in the past. It can't be us. It's, it's already fulfilled. Nero. Antiochus Epiphanes. Now, who is this Antiochus Epiphanes? He was king number seven, I think six or seven, in the, in the dynasty established by the original Seleucus. And he could see Rome coming up in the west. I'm going to fight Rome one day. So he took his army, come down to Egypt to take Egypt, because Egypt and the Nile River Valley, this is the breadbasket of the ancient world, grow a lot of wheat and stuff down there, feed his army. He needed a food supply. You can't go to war without a, an, a, an army that's starving. You have to feed the troops to keep them fighting. And so he said, I'll go down and take Egypt. But the Romans had uh, their spies out, and when they heard that he was heading down to Egypt with his army, they sent an ambassador down. And he met 
Antiochus coming into Egypt and said, what are you doing down here? Now, Antiochus had his army with him. Roman ambassador might have had a centurion and maybe a hundred soldiers or whatever he had. They could have easily been wiped out by the Seleucid army. And he said, oh, I've come down here to take Egypt. Well, he said, the ambassador said, I've got a message to you from Rome. The message is you go back home and leave Egypt alone. And Antiochus thought, well, what shall I do? Shall I uh, annihilate this uh, ambassador and his soldiers and keep pushing on? But he knew that if he did, he almost certainly knew that if he came down in here against the instruction that Rome had sent through this ambassador, that the Roman army would just come in his back door up here. And he's not there to stop them. So he's trapped, wasn't he? Strategically outmaneuvered. And so what did he do? He said, well, when do you want your reply? And the story is told that the ambassador pulled out his sword, stuck it in the ground and drew a circle around the two of them. And then he stepped outside the circle and he said to Antiochus, don't you move out of that circle until you give me your answer. So he thought. He realized that he was caught. The prudent thing to do is to do what I'm told here. He wasn't, he wasn't powerful enough, he wasn't big enough, he wasn't strong enough to fight Rome yet. He's hoping to get that way by maybe calling up an army down here to help him, take the young, able-bodied Egyptian men to put him in his army. So he decided, well, he'd go home. So on his way home, like a bully, and a bully bullies a, a, a little boy, the little boy can't fight the bully, so the little boy picks on someone that's younger than him and takes it out on him, his frustration, takes it out, you know, psychological... It's called in psychological language displaced aggression. Happens a lot of times. I call it transferred hostility. Because he came up here and he attacked Jerusalem in his frustration. Killed a whole lot of Jews in the process and offered a pig on the altar of God in Jerusalem. Polluted the temple with pig's blood. Now, of course, you know, to a Muslim, a pig is very unclean and an abominable animal. You go through Muslim countries in the Middle East and you don't see pigs. You've got some in Indonesia because a lot of Christians in Indonesia, where I was, in Sumatra, you've got pigs there. But most Muslim countries, you won't see a pig. Is that right? You don't see a pig in Iraq. I never saw one there. Some there, but not many. Yeah. So people say he's the Antichrist. He polluted the sanctuary. He's Daniel chapter 8 and 9 talks about casting down the sanctuary and so on. So that's fulfilled in Tyke's Epiphanies. But the secret is this. The ram was great. The goat was very great. And the little horn that followed him, the third power that came along was Rome, and it was exceeding great. Was Tyke's Epiphanies greater than Alexander? Of course not. When told by Roman ambassador to go home, he went home. Where was the picture of somebody that was exceeding great there? Doesn't fit. And furthermore, which, horn, which beast did the little horn of Daniel 7 come out of? The fourth beast. Okay. And Titus comes out of one branch of the third beast. It doesn't fit. Wrong beast. It doesn't fit. Okay. The, the goat's the third one. Greece is the third power. The little horn came out of the fourth power, Daniel 7. And when you got the picture of the parallel prophecies, it's got to come out of the, the fourth beast. It's got to come out of the, the next great empire, which is Rome, not Antiochus Epiphanes. All right. <coughs> so <coughs> we come here now to this uh, passage. Uh, we've got the introduction of pagan Rome, about verse 14 in the chapter. Pagan Rome. And you've got in verse 20, the or raiser of taxes, which is Augustus, the time when Jesus was born. That comes out of verse 20. And a vile person is mentioned in verse 21, which is believed to be Tiberius, another Roman. So we're into the Roman uh, Caesars now, and so on, in, 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 of pagan Rome. And then we come over to verse 30. It says, the ships of Chittim shall come, shall return and do this. Arms shall stand against him, in part, verse uh, 31, and he shall take away the daily 
Sacrifice. Where did we meet those words before? In the prophecy of Daniel 8. Take away the daily. And what powers are talking about there? Papacy. Taking away from men and women the knowledge of the priestly ministry of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary by substituting earthly sanctuary and earthly priesthood. Treading down the sanctuary of God and the truths of the sanctuary. So verse 31, definitely talking again about the papacy. Now, you come on down there and it talks about uh, uh, people being fallen by the sword and persecution, verse 33, by captivity and by spoil for many days. We have the prophecy of many days, 1260 days, for example, in earlier pro- prophecies. So we're, this is parallel prophecy we're into here. And so on. And they shall be fall, and they shall be helped with some help. It says, many shall fall to try them, even to the time of the end. So the, again we're told that this papal power is going to last till the time of the end. Revelation 13 says the deadly wound would be healed. And so on. So there's many verses of the Bible that show the papacy continues to the time of the end. Then it says the king shall do something. Well, why introduce a new power when it's talking about the papacy and says the king would do something? They, some people wanted to introduce revolutionary France in here. It, it doesn't fit. But anyway, see what it says. The king shall do according to his will. She shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. She shall speak marvellous things against the god of gods. She shall proffer until the indignation be accomplished, for that which is determined shall be done. Revolutionary France was like a flash in the pan and gone. Years ago, revolutionary France disappeared from the scene. But the papacy was to last until when? The end of time. Prosper till the indignation be accomplished. Revolutionary France did not prosper until the indignation was accomplished. It finished years ago. So it can't be France. It's got to be the papacy. The papacy is still with us and prospering and so on. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor any God, but he shall magnify himself above all. This is parallel to what we read in Daniel 8, how the papacy would magnify himself and speak blasphemous words and so on. And... uh, and uh, some people have said, well, this, uh, he should not regard the desire of women. U.I. Smith said that's a France's abolition of marriage as a Christian service and making it into a civil contract only. And those that have, uh, some people that have argued that this is the papacy he say, well, neither regard the desire of women. That's a papal uh, the doctrine that the priests should remain celibate and never get married. Well, that's strange too, because it, it says the desire of women. It's not talking about the desire of a man for a wife. It's talking about what women desire. And the interesting thing is, look at the Hebrew word that is there. It's the word chemda. Chemda. Well, where is chemda used in the Bible elsewhere? It's used back in, uh, in uh, the time of uh, King David and King Saul. And Saul was chosen as the uh, as the writer as the to be the new king. <clears throat> you read about it in uh, 1 Samuel nine twenty. He had been told beforehand and anointed by Samuel to be the, new, the king of Israel because Israel wanted a king. And when they were casting lots and took his tribe, he went hiding. Remember, he went and hid among the wagons, and all the goods and chattels that the people had brought for this uh, convocation. And when they took his family and then they took his um, name out of the hat, they went looking for him and they found him hiding and they brought him. And what did Samuel say when he introduced him to the people? Look upon whom is the chemda of Israel, the desire of Israel, used of a person, not used of something like the marriage relationship, used of a person. That's a key. And then we have it also used in Haggai chapter 2 verse 7. The time of the restoration, when they were rebuilding the temple, the old people that had seen Solomon's temple wept because the temple that they were building was nowhere near as beautiful as the one that Solomon had built. They wept. But Haggai encouraged them by saying, the desire of all nations would come to this temple. Who is he prophesying about? Jesus. That Jesus was the chemdar of all nations, the desire of all nations. And Ellen White wrote a book called The Desire of Ages. So this Chemda can be used as a title of Christ. And so what is this verse really saying to us? 
Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. That's a statement about deity. Nor the desire of women. Nor regard any God. You've got God, any God. What's celibacy of the priesthood got to do in the middle? Two statements about God. No, but if you look at the role of what the papacy has done regarding Christ, they virtually put Mary up equal to, the, to, to God. In fact, the late Pope that died, John 23, just died recently, um, he was advocating that Mary should be the fourth person of the Godhead. Remember that? Remember that? Yeah. Yes. Co-redemptrix with Jesus. Redemptrix being... a the feminine form of redeemer. Co-redeemer. Co-redemptrix is the feminine form. That she was a co-redeemer with Jesus. See? And uh, elevating Mary. And it goes on to say, But a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor. The gold and silver and precious stones. Th this God, with small g, Mary, is certainly a God that uh, ancestors didn't know about. Old Testament times, they, Mary wasn't venerated back there, but they venerate her now, and almost worship her, and uh, so on, and claim that she's in heaven, and with her physical body as well, not just a spirit being up there. So I take this verses 36 to 39 as an expansion of the papal, because the statements parallel the prophecies made in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and 9, and finishes up with uh, the papacy. So when I come to chapter... 11 verse 40 to 45, I just believe it carrying on like the pioneers did, talking about the papacy to the end of time. You don't have to introduce Turkey. Turkey's not a world power today. Nobody's very concerned about Turkey anymore. Long since Turkey has had any great uh, influence. So let's have a look at this. The king of the north. Now, this expression, king of the north, why, why is it... <coughs> Would they talk about King of the North in the last days? Well, um, when we look at the history of, um, of the ancient world, <coughs> when God's people were returned from Babylonian captivity, or even before Babylonian captivity, shall we say, they were here. Now I'm going to draw something to highlight. Assyria was to the north of Israel. They oppressed Israel. Yes, they were to the north, but they invaded Israel and they oppressed Israel during the time of the kings of Judah and Israel. The next great power that came along and oppressed them, well, we had some from Syria, then Assyria. You could put down here Syria. But then Babylon came. Now, is Babylon to the north? No, Babylon's to the east. But which way did they come in? You see, this is desert. Very hard for an army to cross over the desert. You go up the river, Tigris, fertile land, you get water. You've got to feed your animals, you've got to feed your water to your horses and your, your um, camels, whatever you, you've got. You've got to have uh, water and food for them. So the, it took a route that came in from the north. And it's interesting to note that Jeremiah's prophecies about the coming of Babylon to invade, ba and Jeremiah was, got himself into trouble with the people because they said, you're promoting the enemy. Uh, he said again and again and again, the uh, enemy would come from the north. Jeremiah 1, 13 and 14. Out of the north an evil will break forth. <coughs> Jeremiah 4, 6. I will bring evil from the north with great destruction. Jeremiah 6, 1. For evil appeareth out of the north. Jeremiah 6, 22, 23. People come from the north. They are cruel. Chapter 10, 22. Great commotion out of the north country will make Judah desolate. Chapter 25, verse 9, Nebuchadnezzar and his families of the north will come against the land. Chapter 46, verse 20, destruction cometh out of the north. Jeremiah 47, the flood of waters from the north. Chapter 50, verse 3, out of the north cometh the nation, make the land desolate. Again and again and again, Jeremiah is talking about 
Trouble coming from the north. Well, actually, it came from the east. But it came in from the north, right? You get the picture? Now, the Seleucids, or <clears throat> well, before we get to the Seleucids, how did Greece get into the Middle East? Alexander the Great. Did he come in from the north? Yes. That was the way that the armies from most countries invaded. The only country invaded from the south is Egypt. See? And where did Rome come in? Rome came in from the north. And when the Seleucid Empire was in force and they tried to stamp out the worship of the true God, and Tigers Epiphanes and, and others, they came in from the north. And God's people are here. And the rival of the king of the north and <coughs> through the Seleucid period was, of course, Egypt in the south. And God's people caught in between the two. So this expression, the north, and trouble coming from the north, can apply to the understanding that uh, the oppressor of God's people is called the power of the north. <coughs> and in the last days, the king of the north is going to be pushed at by the king of the south. <coughs> but where are God's people today? Are they centered here still? God's people all around the world. And if the papacy is the king of the north, is the papacy all around the world? Yes. Virtually every country of the world. You, as somebody said, you'll find three things in every country of the world. Catholics, Seventh-day Adventists, and leave a brother's soap. Or is it Colgate? Well, now we could say Pepsi Cola or Coca Cola. Okay? All around the world. Okay? God's people today are all around the world. And so is the King of the North, papal power, all around the world. See? And it seems to me <coughs> that in order to look at the prophecy, some power is going to push at the King of the North in the last days. And we used to speculate, as I said, speculate, remember my disclaimer at the beginning of the lecture this afternoon, be careful, don't be dogmatic. We used to say, might, might be, might be, we didn't say, it. I never said it was going to be, but people used to think it might be communism. The world would go communist and push at the West. See, that would spark a great war. Armageddon, we talked about this morning, see, just remember what I said about Armageddon this morning. <laughs> All right. But what, where's, the, where's the communist power today? The only stronghold of communism today seems to be North Korea and Cuba. Even Russia's gone capitalistic. Even got the mafia in Russia now. Yeah. And uh, the threat of uh, world domination by communism has sort of evaporated. See what I mean by being careful, don't interpret the prophecies by reading the paper headlines because 30, 40 years ago, headlines were communism. Communism, communism is a great enemy of freedom, a great enemy of you know, communism. Now communism sort of defeated itself, been defeated by circumstances and so on, and uh, things are quite different now. <clears throat> Even communist China has got several areas of its country that they have capitalism in it. You know that? Just opposite Hong Kong and the mainland, Shenzhen, Guangzhou area, what used to be called Canton. I've been there. <clears throat> I've been in the mainland China six times. And I've been up to Beijing twice. And uh, they've got an area up in the north, and they've got an area around Shanghai, and an area around Guangzhou and Shenzhen down in the south, which are capitalist enclaves in China. Communist country. Promoting capitalism because they see the advantages of that system suits, but the rural areas are still predominantly communist because they say that suits the rural areas better. But the industrial areas, capitalism is flourishing in parts of China. <coughs> All right. So <coughs> some power, it appears to me, is going to push at the king of the north, and the king of the north is going to retaliate with the whirlwind. It says horses and chariots and many ships. There is speculation going on that maybe the Muslim world is the king of the south that's going to push at the Western world under the... Because the Western world is coming more and more under the control of the papacy. Europe, you know, has now got common currency over much of the European uh, continent, hasn't it? The Euro, you know. And uh, <clears throat> the British haven't uh, abandoned their pound yet and a few other countries are still 
think the Swedish are still holding on to Krona and some other countries maybe, but you go to Germany and France and Switzerland and, and uh, other places and the Euro, Euro, Euro. You know, and the borders have seemed to come down. When I landed in Rome, they just looked at my passport and gave it back to me and told me to go through. They never even put a stamp in my passport in Rome. Well, that's a different from what it was a few years ago. See? And I went from there and crossed over into East Germany, went to Berlin. When I went uh, by train from, the, from um, uh, into, uh, well, I was into Belgium, I never even knew where the border was. When I went out of Belgium into France, I never knew where the border was. Nobody even came and looked in the compartment of the train I was in. Just like going from here to Melbourne. No border inspection, nothing. Europe has opened up almost like one country in some ways, you see. And largely, the Treaty of Rome is what started it all. Chancellor Adenau of Germany, Chancellor Adenau of Germany years ago, his son was a Jesuit priest. And under Adenau, the Treaty of Rome was signed to set up a common market. And it has grown into the common situation that we have uh, today. Maybe, I'm not dogmatic, and I, I take to heart the counsel of James White, unfulfilled prophecy, don't be dogmatic. But we all speculate, we all want to watch what's happening to see how the prophecy is going to be fulfilled. So let's keep watching. It may be fulfilled in some totally different way than what we imagine today. But whatever is going to happen, I see a great war that's going to eliminate some power that's in opposition to the papacy and the nations that the papacy is controlling. Some power pushes at them. Some have speculated maybe the <coughs> terrorist attacks they have is, is the beginning of the push. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. Don't you go out and say Pastor Toll has said that it is, because I'm telling you I'm not saying that it is. But I'm watching what's happening. I'm interested in, in these prophecies. And uh, if, I, uh, uh, if any of my suppositions, any of my imaginings are wrong, I would be the first one to admit it. Because I know the counsel has been given to us not to be dogmatic on unfulfilled prophecy. But let's have a look at what's going to happen in Daniel 11. Comes against with great horses and chariots and many ships. That's, a, that's war, that's army. Overflows and occupies different countries. And says the land of Egypt shall not escape. Verse 43. And he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt. The Libyans and Ethiopians shall be at his steps. This is economic control, isn't it? Economic control. Papers is going to control economy. I got an email from someone the other day suggesting that someone is deliberately trying to bankrupt, bankrupt the United States. You've been following the news lately, the last few weeks? This crisis, financial crisis in the States. The United States is virtually bankrupt. You know that? Virtually bankrupt. $14 trillion of debt. And they have to pay interest on that debt. Most of the tax money collected from the taxpayers of the United States goes to paying the interest on that debt. What's left they've tried to run the country on? Can you imagine what bill? America's going into debt at the rate of about 600, somewhere between $600,000, $800,000 debt every hour. Going into debt at that rate. If America's bankrupted, the urge is join the common market. Have one worldwide currency for the whole world. Eliminate all these different currencies that we have. Just have one currency for the whole world. Well, I'm not going to say that it's going to happen, but it's interesting to watch what's happening because the United States, as I said before, is virtually bankrupt. And the Republicans and Democrats fighting each other as to how they're going to manage this debt. And they now increase the debt to what is it, $17 trillion they're allowed to go up to. Well, they'll reach that in another year, few years. won't take them all that long at the rate they're going. You know, going to debt, millions of dollars every, two or three million dollars every hour going to debt. Debt's increasing, borrowing, borrowing, borrowing. And you can't, even the world's richest nation can't borrow like that forever and not pay off their debt. Soon they'll be paying so much interest on their debt that they'll have no money to run the country. 
They'll be bust. Well, turn over for just a little bit of an insight, Revelation 18. I wonder if you've ever noticed this passage. Revelation 18. Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, become the habitation of devils. You know those verses, don't you? The loud cry of the third angel. Go out to come out of her, my people, the call is. And then it goes on to say that uh, come out of her, my people, be not partakers of her sins, verse uh, 4. Verse uh, 6, reward to her double. How much she has glorified herself, verse 7, so much sorrow give her. For she says, I am a queen and am no widow and shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning, famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire for strong as the Lord God who judges her. This is a prophecy about the papal power, Babylon. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication live deliciously with her. Fornication in Bible prophecy is a symbol of church-state union. That's what the papacy is. State now and a church. Church Church-state union, which in God's eyes is abomination. And it says here, they bewail her and lament for her when they see the smoke of her burning, say, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth their merchandise any more. That's total economic collapse, isn't it? Nobody's buying anything anymore. Total economic collapse at the end time. The merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and thymine wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of most precious wood and of brass and iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men and motor cars and TVs and iPods and mobile phones. Oh, did I read something I shouldn't? But those are the things that they were traded back in those days. What are the things we trade today? No man buys her merchandise anymore. Total collapse coming at the end. Right, so don't be surprised when it happens. Go back to Daniel 11. In conclusion, I want to look at some very interesting verses toward the end of the chapter. He shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things and so on. But tidings out of the east shall trouble him. Now this morning we talked about Armageddon and the east referring to heaven, to Jesus. So tidings out of the east, is that tidings out of necessarily east of the compass or is this tidings maybe from God's church? I suggest to you that when the latter rain is falling and the loud cry is being given, thousands of people are going to leave the worldly churches where they are today and will join us. You know what Ellen White says? The shaking comes, company after company leave us. I'm sorry about that. I wish that was not going to happen. But tribe after tribe comes in. Which is bigger, a tribe or a company? So we're going to lose a lot when the shaking occurs, but we're going to gain more than we lose. We're nearly 20 million now. A few year, year or two's time, we'll be 20 million worldwide. We're going to lose quite a number, but we're going to gain a whole lot more. All the honest-hearted people in the other religions of Christendom and the other non-Christian religions that are honest and hard, God's going to call them out. And the latter rain is poured out, mighty power. Ten times the power of the midnight cry of 1844, Ellen White says. And the large number comes in. Do you think that will trouble the papacy? Yes. And then it says that tidings out of the east shall trouble him and tidings out of the north shall trouble him. Tidings out of the north could be tidings from his own ranks when thousands desert the papacy and see the truth of the Sabbath and what we've got to preach and teach and come and join us. That will, that will upset them. And then as a result of these tidings, what happens? Therefore he shall go forth, verse 44, with great fury utterly to destroy many. I say that's the death decree we read about in Revelation 13. This is the first referral to it in the Bible, in my thinking that this is referring to the ultimate death decree of Revelation 13, that if you don't have the mark of the beast, you're to be killed. And White said, this is the test that God's people must face before we can be sealed. 
Now, I'm not looking forward to it, but I don't lie in bed at night worrying about death decree. I don't have the strength to be a, a martyr today. God hasn't asked me to be a martyr today. But if he asked me to be a martyr tomorrow, he can give me the strength to be a martyr. So let's not get all uptight and lose sleep over <coughs> trust in the Lord. And even if we lose our life for truth here, and our future in heaven is certain, we're winners, aren't we? As one person I heard say, he said, I envy the righteous dead. Because their future is secure. We who are still living, we're the ones that are still at risk. Because any one of us can apostatize. Any one of us can throw it in. Any one of us can give up the faith under trial or stress or persecution if we don't hold on to the Lord. The Lord is able to keep that which is committed to him against that day. He's able to preserve us if we are dedicated completely to him. And so on. But I see that as the death decree there. Utterly to take away many. And he shall plant the tabernacle of his palaces between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. What does that mean? Well, we know from <coughs> what Bible and Spirit of Prophecy tell us that before the end, Satan's great masterpiece is to do what? Impersonate the coming of Christ. And to de declare that he did change the Sabbath. And these stubborn Seventh-day Adventists are the only people that won't acknowledge that I did it. This, this, this impersonation takes place before the close of probation. Because if it's going to deceive some, he has to be deceived. they have to be deceived before the close of probation because nobody's going to change sides after the close of probation. As I said this morning, remember? He that is filthy, then be filthy still. He that is holy, then be holy still. No changing sides after that decree goes forth. And that goes through at the close of probation. So any effort by Satan to get people to deny their faith has to be before the close of probation because he will not succeed after. And there will be no martyrs after the close of probation. You know that? That's an encouraging thought to keep in the back of your mind. Ellen White says, for Satan to have some believer put to death after the close of probation would be a triumph for him and God will not allow it. Quote, quote. God will not allow it, she says. Why? Well, God allows martyrdoms before the close of probation because the blood of martyrs can be the seed of the church. When Stephen was stoned, who was convicted? Saul, Saul became the apostle Paul. See? God may allow martyrs before him because somebody else seeing the testimony of your faithfulness may say, this is something I've got to look into and take a stand for truth. But after the close of probation, it's too late for anybody to benefit from a martyr, being shed, blood being shed. God will not allow it. All right, this impersonation of Christ. If Satan comes, Ellen White says, he will appear in various places on the earth. <laughs> Where might some of these places be? I, I, I speculate here. This is my speculation now. I'm allowed to speculate a little bit, but I won't be dogmatic about it. I think one place he'd go would be, would be Rome. He might well turn up there. Another place he might go to might be Salt Lake City. Because Matthew 24 says, Behold, if they say he's in the desert, go not forth. You know, the desert, Salt Lake City, there's a desert area around it. All right, another place he might be almost certain to be would be go to Jerusalem. And uh, who would be on the first jet plane to fly into Jerusalem to meet him? The Pope. Yes, I'm sure the Pope would be on the first plane out of Leonardo da Vinci Airport in Rome to go down to meet, to meet Christ down in Jerusalem. And well, the, whether that's what it means, I don't know. But it says he'd plant his tabernacle between the glorious holy mountain, between the seas, the, sea, the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, the glorious holy mountain, that would be Jerusalem. Something's going to happen there. I don't know all the details about it, but something's going to happen there. Prophecy says so. Watch the space. But don't be dogmatic about it. <laughs> I hope I've driven that point home sufficiently this afternoon. See? So there is about all that I can say about the King of the North. I believe that the prophecy is a continuation of the parallelism of the other prophecies, that is the papacy right through to the end of chapter. But it says there, he shall come to his end and none shall help him. The papacy is going to collapse. You read about it over in the book of Revelation. The ten horns reign with the beast for one hour 
And then when they see that it's uh, been deceived and so on, they says they turn on her and burn her with fire. Rend her and burn her with fire. Those that support the papacy in the last days, when they realize that they've backed the wrong power, I was going to say back the wrong horse, <laughs> but I better not use <laughs> that expression because I'm not a gambling man and I <laughs> don't know much about horse racing. But you know what I mean. They've chosen to put their lot in with the papacy and they realize that they've made a big mistake. They turn on her and they destroy her. And it says, <clears throat> strong is the Lord God who judges her. And the kingdom of God comes out supreme at the end. Revelation, a new heaven and a new earth. Paralleling the kingdom of God established in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, Daniel 8 and 9 prophecy and Daniel 11 also. And Daniel was told, you will stand in your lot at the end of the days. <coughs> It's going to be exciting to get to heaven. <coughs> Meet Daniel. <laughs> hey, Daniel, we studied your book. <laughs> yeah, we looked at some of the prophecies that you wrote down there in Fairfield Church. Yeah. And we meet Paul. We might have to wait in the queue to see Paul because I know some theologians have booked up time to talk to Paul first before me. <laughs> I remember one man saying that, I'm going to spend the first so many days with Paul to sort out what he, what he really meant by some of these things he thought and wrote in his epistles. And someone says, well, you have to get in the queue behind me because I'm ahead of you. <laughs> We're going to have an exciting time meeting some of these people, aren't we? Yeah. People saved by grace. So are we. We'll be saved by God's grace. Not because of our good works, but be because of what Jesus has done for us. Make you love him, doesn't it? Makes you love him. What he was willing to go through to make it possible for us to have the chance of eternal life. The choice is ours. Let's pray. Father in heaven, <coughs> thank you for the opportunity we've had of looking at your word this afternoon. There are some things about future unfulfilled prophecy that we do not know for sure, but we do speculate. <coughs> we do look and watch what is happening. Help us not to be dogmatic about things that we do not know in all detail because you have not revealed all the details to us. <clears throat> the one thing we do know, and that is that Jesus is a great Savior who gave his life for us, made it possible for us to have eternal life. Keep each of us true and faithful to him is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs>